Welcome to another episode of your favorite religious studies podcast. It's the Religious Studies Project. He's David Robertson and he's Christopher Carter. And we're brought to you in association with the BASR and NAASR. And today, David has been speaking to Tom Wagner on music, marketing, and megachurches. Oh yeah, take it away me. During the 20th century, the media has expanded exponentially to include radio, television, and most recently, and perhaps influentially, the internet. Music has been a big part of this new emerging mediaopolis, moving from a largely standalone medium to part of a marketing matrix of people, places, and industries. Today, music's meaning is more often part of a branded ecosystem, uh, kind of not limited to entertainment, but part of the experience of everyday life, including religion. Evangelical megachurches and increasingly new religious movements use music as part of their branding exercise, which helps to transform them from local congregations into a transnational enterprise. To discuss these intersections of music, marketing and religiosity, I'm joined today by Dr. Tom Wagner. Tom is a teaching fellow at the Reed School of Music at the University of Edinburgh. He holds a PhD in ethnomusicology from the Royal Holloway University and a master's in percussion performance from Rutgers University. Before moving to the UK, Tom spent several years as a freelance percussionist and educator and from 2009 to 2014 performed with the Balkan music quintet Taco Drom and founded and directed the RHIL Balkan Music Ensemble. Now I should have checked the pronunciation of all of those actually, but no, it's Tacho Drom. Tacho, yeah. It was Romanic or something, but never mind. It was good. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, welcome to the Religious Studies Project, Tom. Thank you. Uh, you are our first ethnomusicologist to the project, so uh, looking forward to this. Um, let's uh, start as we often do and um, ask you a little bit about your background and specifically how you got to looking at religion in this uh, music in a religious context. Yeah. Um, well, to be honest, it was it's sort of you know, not what I started out to do, obviously. So, but, you know, as, as you said, I, I had studied music as, as an undergraduate and uh, on the master's level and then was freelancing in Washington, D.C. for a long time. Uh, and, I mean, really the background is my mother teaches marketing at the University of Maryland, so I've always just sort of had that in sort of the background of everyday life just you know just sort of an awareness of of marketing and this kind of stuff and so i was hired to play percussion in a, uh, a mega church that had you know it, had, it would have uh an orchestra one week with a praise band and then uh, a jazz band the next week and then a, an irish tin whistle ensemble <laughs> next week but it was one of those things uh where they would have different type of music every week, but the the mega church itself. I mean, the first time I'd never seen anything like this, and you know, the first time I drove up this thing, it was you know, there's a, a large parking garage, and I was like, well, maybe the church is behind the parking garage, but no, actually, it was that was part of the church. <laughs> so like, okay, this is really interesting. Um, and then when I moved over to the UK, I did another master's in ethnomusicology, and for some reason, this just seemed like a good thing to talk about for whatever reason, maybe just for access. Uh, and that just sort of went from there. I actually, people say, how did you get upon um, Hillsong, which was my thesis topic, and I actually don't remember at all. I just happened one day to wander into the Hillsong London, and there it was. Uh, so that's that's really the genesis of it, you know, just be, being an ethnomusicologist, you sort of talk about things through music, but it's always been actually more and more of an interest in marketing and branding, and the religion thing just sort of happened because I'm also just interested in basically how we sell ourselves things, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. including belief, you know, so yeah. I guess that's the best way of explaining it. So uh, th these kind of mega churches are very... Um, very contemporary kind of expression of this use of music and uh, a very kind of obvious one as well. There's a lot of attention in the media as well as in academia, of course. But it's not a new phenomenon, is it? I mean, the evangelical tradition has been using music actively for a long time. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's right. I mean, 
for me, if, if you look back, it's sort of, it's sort of the, the genesis of the evangelical movement, at least in North America. Um, what I always say is that these preachers had marketing and branding figured out centuries before marketers and brand, brand <laughs> actually figured this thing out, you know, okay. because at its core, marketing, at least contemporary marketing, is A, multimedia, but B, absolutely effective. I mean, it's, it's, it's all about emotion and it's about connection and it's about community and how do you engender this, right? Mm -hmm. Using whatever media is available at the time. And, you know, marketing didn't really figure this out until about 1950s. You know, Edward Bernays, the, the godfather of yeah. PR, yeah. started this, he figured this thing out, you know, beginning of the century and really sort of codified it. Madison Avenue picked this up in the, the 50s. But before that, it was very functional. This will do something for you. But you look back at the history of evangelicalism they they always i mean i, and I think they've probably always known this even mm -hmm. you know, religion has probably always known that that the effective aspect of religion is how you get people right right so that's that's sort of where i start with with that and then as you and the, the other thing about um evangelicals is that they're all very happy to use whatever media is available whatever way you can get the people so if you look back when it was just print media well those guys used it very, very effectively. Um, just all the way back to sort of George Whitefield and Benjamin Franklin, yeah, well, anyway, all this sort of stuff. Where you know they they sent out publicity, right? Mm -hmm. And that in but well, great, and that in turn boosted sales of tracks. And it's like, hey, right there, you know. And uh, I guess, I mean. I don't know about in the colonial era, but certainly later in the, the Victorian era. I mean, I guess a lot of the popular songs were also religious songs anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I said, and that's, that's sort of interesting because on the one hand, uh, you sort of posit, at least again in the, the North American context, but also in the UK context, at least sort of a separation between the church and state. But certainly, as you were saying, in the Victoria era, those songs the religious songs were very much part of the popular culture mm -hmm. at the time you know and then as, as as you move to you know just before recorded area with sort of moody and sankey and these sorts of guys it was, it was very their, their published things were you know in the backs of magazines or in the in in newspapers and they came with your soap or whatever you bought you know, it's really yeah. interesting stuff and I think we tend to forget as well that recorded music is a relatively new phenomena. Certainly recorded music um, in the way that we consume it nowadays is uh, you know, really only goes back to, well, uh, it, uh, technologically it goes back further, but it's really the early 50s when it becomes a, a kind of a big deal, right? Yeah, most, I mean, I think it, the, interesting when you, when you follow, follow that sort of the development of recording technology and sort of personal recorded technology. I think that's really where it gets. Once you start getting the, the record industry right, yeah, going yeah. on, that's yeah. when it starts, you start moving from sort of publicly consumed music to privately consumed music. And mm -hmm. I think that probably has profound effects on the way music is used, say, in worship, mm -hmm. you know, um, both, both publicly and privately, right? Yeah. Yeah, so... So it means that these kind of uh, religious popular songs, mm -hmm. if we call them that, can they move out of this um, specifically church ritual congregational kind of context and into people's everyday lives. Exactly. Yeah, and that's where you start getting that connection with branding, though, right? Right. Because when what you know what is the ultimate brand? It's 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 the brand that you use in your everyday rituals, right? So mm -hmm. it's like I'm gonna have a Coca Cola with dinner or whatever it is yeah right yeah you know, yeah and you don't even think about it right that that's where you get it you know that's that's the sort of the golden mm. standard for that stuff and you've made some nice um uh, comments about that actually and i thought this was particularly uh, an interesting line to go down um and it, it's, this is from your focal uh, piece which we'll link to on the uh, on the 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 podcast page um we, you're right you know um, branding is often presented as a form of advertising, as a means of selling rather than a mediated communication exercise. But what you're arguing is that um, 
branding is a, a, a concomitant process, right? So, okay, so it goes back and forth between um, uh, the the brander and the the consumers, if you like. Um, it evolves with an organisation, um, and so the you know the the growth of these religious organisations and the branding kind of. Uh, go hand in hand. It's not that the churches are using branding. It's that branding is part of their growth in this, uh, what I call the mediopolis. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's a good way of putting it. So then like, I mean, first of all, when that's why I, I generally talk about marketing rather than branding, because marketing is communication mm -hmm. and it's, you know, and mm -hmm. it's, it's very basic. So it's, I mean, you could say it's, Without ideology, of course, it always has ideology. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. that's a different story. But you know, by itself, marketing is just a form of communication, and branding arises from that, or yeah. is part of it, depending on on you how, how you talk about it. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. But the the most uh, quote unquote authentic brands are the ones that arise sort of organically, right? Right. right. Just as as part of what we're doing. So you know, it has the you know the that's why corporations or whatever they, they want to have a strong corporate ethos that, that everybody buys into because it, it has to be sort of authentic, especially yeah. these days where we sort of sniff out inauthenticity right away. Right. In consumer, we're always afraid that we're going to sell, be sold something. Right. Yes. I think that's particularly important for churches. Yeah, of course. Right. Yeah. You know, so that thing that you, it can't be, but at the same time, especially with these mega churches, you know, the other thing you have to remember about, marketing is that it's, it's very much a product of our mediated environment, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, and has mm -hmm. to do with the media. So it's, it's always going to be that it's, it's that fine line between, you know, um, the mech, the mechanisms of consumer culture and the mechanisms of every other culture aspect of culture. They're the same mechanisms, yes, right? Exactly, we're yeah. using the same music. We're using the same technology. We're doing that. So when we're used to, you know, say, uh, mm -hmm. A song being released with a film and this and that and the other, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's just, I mean, that's part of the, that larger way of we, we make meaning, right? Mm -hmm. So what, basically mm -hmm. what I'm arguing is that in consumer culture, we, it's, it's sort of, it's marketing is part of the vernacular that we use to communicate, right? So, I mean, where I tend to go in the end is that where, whereas a lot of times mega churches, they'll get blasted through branding. Yes. And authentic. Actually, I think it's part of, like, a, an inextricable part of the religious experience for at least a certain section of society. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just you can't take it out of it. And you took, if you took it out of it, it would be maybe, you know, authentic or easy. Mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you wouldn't experience it quite as intensely. Indeed. Yeah. And I mean, the most effective brands um, or the most effective marketing, I mean, it's almost invisible that you're selling something. It becomes effective when you're joining a community, you're part of a community. And that obviously speaks so much to what the evangelicals are doing and the, the actual lived experience of being involved in an evangelical church. Yeah, absolutely. Um, which, yeah, I think it's very, very interesting. Um, can we have a look at a case study then? Um, could you Talk to me a little bit about your work with the Hillsong Church. Uh, they're a, a mega church, right? So t tell us, um, well, first of all, what's a mega church? And then tell us about your work there. Well, mega church, um, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you read all kinds of different definitions. Generally, this textbook one is something with more than 10,000 members. Right. Right. And that's in, a, in one congregation, right? In one con. Well, what, then you get sort of questions with these transnational ones. Was a member, was a congregation, <laughs> yes, yes. all these sorts of, of things, you know, and which also speaks to the, you know, the community and the branding aspect and sort of, you know, how do people identify with the church? How do they, and you know, do they do they self-identify as members? But okay, so let's just call it more than ten thousand members. For, yeah, for a mega for reason, yeah. yeah. Why not? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if, yeah. A lot of people will be familiar with with Hillsong, um, especially if you're evangelical, because you know if you're evangelical, you are probably singing a Hillsong song in church at some point, right? Every Sunday. Right. So Hillsong, it's uh, oh gosh, I don't remember the exact date. I think they started in about 1985 or something in Australia, and um, through their music became very popular. So now they they have actual planted churches on all the inhabited continents except for South America, 
but are probably moving into Brazil very soon. Uh, you know, we're talking Paris, Kiev, Moscow, uh, New York, LA, London, you know, places in Germany, all, all over the world. Right? Just, uh, they expand. I've lost track of them. Stop mm. trying to. <laughs> you know, it's really amazing. And the way they've done this is through their music. I mean, they have had an incredible influence on the evangelical soundscape right, in the yeah. last 20 to 30 years, which of course then brings in all sorts of questions about, you know, the theology embedded in that. But what's, what's interesting is that, um, you know, the, the way they use this music, uh, in, in general. So I, I don't know if I'm quite answering or going where you No, go cool, good. Take um, it whichever way you want. It's fine. So, I mean, basically, Basically, when I was when I was uh, the bulk of my work with them was when I was doing my uh, PhD thesis, where I spent sort of three years um, in the, the London Church and interviewing people and participating and doing the small groups and all this kind of stuff. And the the idea was, as we were saying earlier, that maybe the the marketing was very much part of the religious experience mm -hmm. you know and within that that people and this idea that marketing is of course a two-way thing especially now so you have to work to get it how do people use the marketing to further their walk as christians right yes, it, right yeah, yeah. okay so um part of that was really interesting so every year they re release an album and you have to understand we're talking more than 40 million albums sold by this point right yeah 40 platinum and gold albums all kinds of stuff when they when they release an album, it'll be or you know their 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 single will go to number two, not on the religious charts, but on the pop charts, yeah, right? Yeah. If only for a week, it's really interesting. I mean, they'll they'll bump Beyonce off the off the top right. of the list. Of course, you know when you when you track the the sort of trajectory of it, it's like boom, they're up there for two weeks and they crash. Yeah. Because basically, everyone in the church and probably and a bunch of you know every fan. <laughs> who, who's a fan of them will go and buy this single right away. So it's not like they have millions and millions and millions of fans yeah. like Justin Bieber, but they have a hardcore thing that they will continually right. buy these albums every year. Because I mean, if you, if you think of it, this is what's amazing. They have almost the perfect product. And mm -hmm. I, I don't mean to put it as that, you know, I mean, I'm not, yeah, and agree, yeah, but if you think about it in sort of purely capitalist terms, it's the perfect product, yeah. right? Because, it's not only, you know, you, you look at pop stars and they struggle to continually put out, well, they struggle to continue to put up a quality album, which these guys do because they co-write pretty much everything. Yeah. They go through a very stringent editing process, um, which includes field testing the songs before they record them, mm -hmm. which is interesting. So they have a, a, a very, a very strong quality control process. But beyond that, The product itself is annoying, to, isn't it? Right. So it's not yeah. just people are buying an album for entertainment. People are buying it because this is part. This is what they use for the the God encounter. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So it's like I mean, you're basically buying this artifact <laughs> every year, which is which is why I say you 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 almost have this inbuilt uh, sales already. Right. You know? So and of course this then goes to sort of or it helps further promoting. You know, because evangelicalism is all about numbers. It's all about, yeah. hey, we've reached so many people in Haywood. So, hey, we sold a million albums every right. year. It must be anointed. Right, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. Also, it's, it's amazing. And it's you, see, you see that in other evangelical yeah. media as well. I mean, I'm thinking about the Left Behind novels, for instance, and the, yeah. the, the number of copies sold is almost bigger than the title. <laughs> um, and... Um, also, I mean, recently in the States, there's been a, an upsurge of these kind of religious films. Mm -hmm. um, doing well in the, the you know in the, the mainstream box office um and again you sort of get the impression that for a lot of the audience actually being seen to take part you know it's the prominence we all went look this is pr this is doing well this proves that faith is important and you know it must be anointed as you said <laughs> um so it's almost not only is consuming the media part of the part of their own personal journey, but it's part of the evangelical um, mm. project. It's part of the, um, you know, testifying and bringing new people in. Yeah. And what well, you're exactly right. And what I found really interesting in terms of sort of music as being part of this, 
overall uh, mediated presentation, overall the you know the, the, the branding is that it's really so. Basically, Hillsong has a what I call a, a liturgical calendar. Um, so they they do Easter and they do Christmas, and that's that's pretty much it in terms of that. Now I'm mm-hmm. crossing it a bit, but right, yeah, know, they do they do Easter and Christmas, and then the rest of their quote unquote high holidays are their conferences, mm-hmm, right? mm-hmm. which are tied into the album releases. Right. Right. So yeah. synergy. They, so in, in, <laughs> at their summer conference, they will always release the new album. Right. Uh-huh. But so this also impinges on the recording cycle. Right. So, so basically what happens is that, um, and of course it's also tied into, so basically at the beginning of the year, Brian Houston, the, the founder will, will release this, uh, Film. It's a film sort of statement of his his heart for the year, right? His mm-hmm. vision, right? And what will be included in there are sort of the tropes, right? That that will be used. So, for example, when I was doing my field work, it was um, the Scarlet Thread, right? Right. So this this idea that Jesus is the uh, thread that binds humanity, and Scarlet being his his blood and this kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. And it, was, it had this visual imagery of a, a Scarlet Thread, right? Okay. And so throughout the year, this theme comes up, pops up in the preaching. Now, individual pastors will have their own things, but it mm-hmm. sort of it pops up particularly in all this sort of marketing, this sort of stuff, and the visual imagery right. also. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. Know, so you have these visual tropes that are drawn from years past as well. So you get this this great sense of connection mm-hmm. that you know goes from year to year, but every year is a new cycle. So it starts there. And these songs that have been worked on, you know, are taught they're they're field tested, but they're also taught to the to the congregation. Um, so at a certain point they'll have the live recording cause it's always the live album. Right. Right. And so everybody already knows the songs to sing along and you go together and they, they at London, uh, they, you know, had the four regular services and everybody came and it was just a recording session. So they did this over four weeks or something. No, it, it was, it was, it was it, this was all done actually on one. one night. I mean, the whole thing is sort of a year long process. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking entirely practically about the recording now. This oh, is yeah. my sort of practical mind kicking. Yeah. No, I mean, they, they, it's like, well, this, the, of oh, that particular one I'm talking about, they only got about two tracks now. Right. Okay. But they do the same thing in, in, Aust- in Australia. Well, you have different, you have the Hillsong Live album that comes out, and then you have the, the studio album for um, Hillsong United. Oh, I see. And now, of course, they have this this third stream, the youth stream, which I haven't actually um, looked at very much. But What's Hillsong, Hill, uh, Hillsong United? What's that? So, the, the you basically have sort of come three ways or three generations now. Okay, of right, Hillsong yeah. Song band. The original was sort of Darlene Check, and it was called Hillsong Live, and this was sort of the genesis of the Hills, the live they would record quote unquote live worship albums mm-hmm. every year. So that that was the mid nineties that started. It's sort of the mid nineties, and they still do that. That's sort of like the the older, I see. yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> you know, the sort of forties and fifties age yeah, group right. kind of thing. Then you had have Hillsong United, which was originally the youth group and that was uh i don't know if it started but it was it's fronted by uh joel houston who's <laughs> brian houston's son i see yeah, yeah. and that was sort of the, the youth group but of course now these guys are all in their 30s yeah <laughs> right? so you have a you have a new now that uh it's called hillsong young and free i believe oh, okay. and this is sort of the, the new thing and they do um yeah, a little more hip hop, a little more this 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 kind of aesthetic. So you have this this third stream coming in, and okay. they're very, very savvy about you know how they mm-hmm. market these things. They have mm-hmm. these three marketing streams. Um, part of it is 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 a, a, again, it's not again, it's a quality control issue. So so they're very much about um, the the they don't want to put out an inferior product for a number of reasons. Yeah. Logically one, but just, just in general, they, they don't, they're very careful about that. Um, yeah. So it's, um, they, that, so at a certain point, you know, the different people ask, why don't the different churches all have their own albums? Cause Hillsong London for a while produced a couple of right, albums. Yeah. And the, well, when I spoke to, um, George, uh, Ag- Agajanian, who's the, general manager he said i mean very succinctly that it was it was sort of a quality control thing that people were getting confused about who is 
who is Hillsong, right? I see, so it's about yeah, yeah. Maintaining, and that's the trick with sort of transnational branding. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And this is another thing I find mm-hmm. really interesting is like how, especially with religion, is how do you maintain a very specific, you know, image or or message, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. In an international context, right. where things that will always get lost in translation, right? You know, that's very interesting kind of challenge and when when you start talking about you know lyrics and this kind of stuff mm-hmm. so they have sort of official translations of into all these all these languages although more now they're they're starting to um have like spanish language albums yeah and there's yeah. i think they're also starting to actually publish non-hillsong music so from churches that may be affiliated with Hillsong, right. but not necessarily that. I so I think they're doing some in, don't quote me on this, but like Taiwan, and I think maybe they're doing stuff with some indigenous like churches. Affiliates sure. rather than, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's but, interesting. Well, that kind of ties back to, to what you said at the beginning, you know, that music is uh, actually very often that thread which ties these different aspects of a brand together. And you're, you know, talking about the way that um, a song tied to the release of a movie, for instance, um, can connects the disparate aspects of the advertising. Um, so, um, you know, it's interesting to see that working in a, in a religious context. I mean, particularly for me, um, it's that I, I dislike separating religion from other aspects of culture. Um, you know, the, problems with the term culture, you know, notwithstanding, but um, for me, these aren't, it's not a separate sphere, you know, the same mechanisms I think are operating all around. So it's interesting to see the way that these particular issues for people, particular ideologies in the, you know, in the broad sense of the word are reflected in people's practices and modernity. Um, okay. So one last little thing. Uh, I know that you are starting to work on um, your, a new project where you're looking at Scientology um, through a similar kind of lens. I know it's in its early days, but it would be, I know a lot of our listeners are really interested in new religions. Uh, so could you maybe give us a little flavor of where you're going with that? Uh, I can try. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I, we ask. It should, it should, I, I should start out by saying that I think I'm not too far along and certainly my issue with a lot of Sort of this. Well, it's it's this, actually it's it's very f- similar. The study of popular music and the study of new new uh, religions are very similar, or suffer the same problem. Is that there's not a whole lot of ethnographic work that gets right, done. Right. right. For popular music, it's because yeah, Madonna doesn't have time to talk to you. <laughs> you know. Um, and with new uh, religious movements, like yeah. David Miscavige doesn't want to talk to you either, yeah, right, yeah. you know, for, for whatever reason, but, um, which isn't to say you can't do it, but, and then the other part is that, um, I was actually, I was reading, uh, actually something the other day, I don't remember the author, but it was, um, he was, he was, he was saying that basically scholars of new religious movements, at the, new, or the study of new religious movements, one of the few academic fields where you can write about it a religion without having read too many of the primary documents mm-hmm. still, mm-hmm. you know, so that's, that's what I'm coming from. What I'm trying to do is connect. Well, I'm, I'm trying to understand the entire sort of Scientological aesthetic through the sound world. If we want to yeah, yeah. call it that, because there's, there's definitely, as we were talking before, but there, there's definitely an aesthetic, right? It's just mm-hmm. sort of how do you articulate that and how do you articulate it? Um, a fairly, but B sort of intelligently, by which I mean mm-hmm. sort of, you know, vis-a-vis historically, how did this religious movement begin, you mm-hmm. know, and, and, and where is it going and all these sorts of things. So it's uh, without putting too much import to it, it's not inconsequential, you know, yeah, even studying. Um, plus it's also fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so, so what I'm working on right now is actually the, the, the literary soundtracks of L. Ron Hubbard. So he was obviously a very prolific science fiction writer. And towards the end of his life, he wrote uh, two rather large books. One was uh, Battlefield Earth, um, which then was later infamously mm-hmm. <laughs> made a movie, um, which, as we we're also discussing, actually makes a little bit more sense once you've read the book. <laughs> uh, anyway, but he, so. And the other was Mission Earth, which is actually a 10-part volume. So what's interesting is that 
you know, in Scientology, you get a lot of claims, sort of very large claims, like L. Ron was the first person to do this. And sometimes yes, and sometimes no, and sometimes, uh, you know. But as far as I can tell, he was actually the first person to record soundtracks to books right or books I've, yeah. I've done that and there's a, there's a company now that's just started in the past few years that's actually selling auditory sound worlds while you read a book and mm. so it tracks how how you read on a tablet and it will sort of advance the soundtrack as you read so it's, it could actually be that he was you know ahead of his ahead time, of his time this, yeah. Yeah. um which is is really interesting but i'm sort of working on that and seeing where it goes because there's lots of really interesting connections with popular culture um with musicians isaac mm -hmm. hayes mm -hmm. chick korea um even john travolta yeah yeah exactly oh yeah who is who is yeah so who was a pretty decent singer yeah, I love it. yeah. It's, it's true um and then you know even farther afield there's some wacky triangulations between uh you know parliament afrofuturism and the nation of islam <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, and, yeah. So, absolutely. and that I'm just sort of am vaguely aware of, but hey, you know. And that stuff carries right up to the present day. The yeah. Wu Tang clan, for instance, are heavily involved in 5% Islam. Yeah. So, but, um, yeah. <laughs> well, hey, we need to kind of wrap it up now, yeah. but hopefully you can come back in maybe a year's time and tell us a little bit more about uh, the, the new religions and music. That's uh, yeah. a fascinating uh, world, which I enjoy myself. And hopefully our listeners have enjoyed today. So um, thanks again, Tom. Tom. Thank you very much. An excellent conversation there, David, as always. Um, as someone who um, earns a, a bit of his keep and spends a lot of his spare time uh, singing and singing in churches because... That is ultimately where a lot of the classical music repertoire in Europe emerged. Um, uh, there's a lot in that interview that I can empathize with. And, uh, you know, obviously megachurches are a quite different context to the sort of cathedrals and village churches of yesteryear. But there's a lot of similarities as well. Absolutely. And I'm thinking it would be nice to maybe do a, a follow-up interview somewhere down the line where we talk about the construction of sort of anti-religion amongst countercultural music. Exactly. Um, so, you know, such as black metal being the obvious example, but also yeah. in, you know, hip-hop circles and so on. Absolutely. Maybe yeah. we'll try and get Monica Miller on to do one on hip-hop next yeah. time we're in the States. Yeah, we absolutely should. And um, Owen Coggins, if you're listening, um, we have tried to set up an interview with him before, but we just didn't, our paths didn't cross. No, but, maybe uh, be ASR this year. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Monica, if you're listening, get in touch. Yeah. Um, next week, we bring bring you back. And I know David and I um, would be up there in your list of favorite RSP interviewers. But next week, you got to admit, it's probably your favorite interviewer. It's Tommy Coleman um, speaking with John Jong on a terror management approaches to the study of religion. Tommy's the podcaster's podcaster, I think. Yeah. Um, pure class. Um, yeah. And this is this is an interesting one. Um, this is we've had a, we had a small piece about terror management on the site it was a halloween special a halloween special yeah but yeah. they're going to go into it um a little bit more uh and this is very much in tommy's wheelhouse i believe as the americans say you know <laughs> uh, cognitive science and psychology where they meet in the study of religion so looking forward to that a great yeah. deal um, we're also looking forward to, we've got a few interesting recording sessions which are coming up. We're going to be at the Open University in Milton Keynes in a couple of weeks, uh, running a digital humanities workshop and also recording, hopefully, an interview and a roundtable, get some video content from that. Um, so you should be hearing and probably seeing some of the outputs of that in the next month or so, really. Um, and we've also just been setting up some recording at the Sakura Conference uh, that's happening at Lancaster University in um, early July. Indeed, it's been a couple of years since we've been at the Sakura Conference, but um, we're happy to be going this year. And um, we'll have a lot more detail about this as, it's, uh, as it finalizes. Um, but we're going to be recording quite a few interviews while we're there. Um, if you're going to be there, do drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you if you want to get involved in any way, even if it's um, just to stop and say hello or have a drink. Um, also because it's Lancaster University and we've got um, big love for Lancaster. Big love. All they have to do now is give me a PhD and I'll love them um, more than pizza. It's just a matter of time, I'm yeah. sure. Um, 
So that's us done wittering, I think. Just remember Amazon, Google+, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, iTunes, and ultimately, thanks, thanks for, for listening. listening.